What's up everybody, welcome back to Totally Exposed. And um, as you can see in this video, we are here in Neil's kitchen. That's right, we're not baking a cake this week. <laughs> no, we're not. What we're gonna, we're gonna make a different kind of mess. Uh, <laughs> Neil's gonna be learning Final Cut Pro 10. He's never used it before in his life. Complete novice. Um, so, this might be interesting. Let's do this. Let's do this. So, like we just said, Neil's never, you've never used Final Cut Pro before. I've never even opened it, no. Okay, um, so you, you have edited videos though, you're not a total novice no, at video editing. No, using Premiere Pro. So the structure of the video is going to be, um, I'm just going to kind of go end to end, just enough to get from some raw footage that you got to a video that you can output to put on YouTube or Facebook or Instagram or wherever it is that you want to put it. Cool. So, we need to begin by opening up Final Cut Pro. Have you got it installed at least? I've got it installed. It came pre-installed. Oh, okay, so fancy. Right. <laughs> That's one less thing I had to do. So what we're gonna be doing here is we're gonna be recording my screen uh, so we can cut to see what we're doing. Um, and then Neil's gonna be following along on his computer. So, if you want to follow along as well with exactly what we're doing, feel free, fire up Final Cut Pro 10 now and we'll, uh, we'll get started, shall we? Let's do this. Before we start looking around what all these different windows are, let's talk about actually getting your footage from your camera onto your computer. Where should you be putting it? So my recommendation is always to be editing off of an external hard drive, if you can. I think these are fantastic. They're great for editing whilst you're on the go. Oh yeah, they're really small, I like them. Um, if you haven't got one of these, don't worry. You can still just use your actual computer. You can store the files on here, but you will find that um, obviously, especially if you're kind of shooting 4K and you're editing 4K timelines, that your computer storage is going to fill up rather sharply. So you've opened up the software. Um, yours may not look exactly the same as mine because I've, I've changed my layout ever so slightly. Um, but you should see a kind of a big separation of a top section here and a bottom section here. Yep. The top left, you'll see uh, this is what's known in Final Cut Pro as the browser. Right, okay. Okay, um, and when we start importing footage, all your footage that you've imported in, that's where it's all gonna live. The next window here, that's where you can see the items. That's like the panel of the browser. So that's like the folders. Right, okay. That's the contents of the Got folders. Um, running along to the middle, that's your main preview window. So when you're working either with a clip in your browser, or if you're watching the actual timeline, that central window is is where that will appear. Okay. Um, so that's slightly different from Premiere Pro. You had two windows in Premiere Pro, didn't yeah. you? You had one to see the clips and one to see what the timeline. Yes, that's right, yeah. This is all kind of munged, munged together, yes. Um, on the right is the inspector. So when you are clicking on a clip, it will give you more information about the clip. Right. If you click it on audio file, it will give you more information about the audio file. It's kind of context aware of what it is you're clicking okay. on. And this bottom area here is essentially the timeline, which is where you will do your editing work. And that's where you're going to build your masterpiece it's of a movie. It's where the magic happens. Indeed. Now Final Cut Pro has some key terminology that you should get your head around. Um, namely, libraries events, projects. Right. It took me a bit of a while to get my head around these when I first moved over to Final Cut Pro. Um, I have done a whole video talking about these and I think most of it is waffle, so I apologize, <laughs> but this is how I see it. Now you can structure it however you want, but for the purposes of this, and this is how we work, a library is the whole video in itself. So if we wanted to do a YouTube video, all about we're going to review a lens I would make a new library for that whole video okay within that you can create events and events are sort of folders I will call them which store media of different types so you could have one event which is just a dumping ground for everything all your audio or your video or your images or your sound effects everything can go in there or you could create an event for videos, an event for pictures, an event for music, 
Um, so are they different from bins then in Premiere Pro? They are sort of the same as a bin, I would assume. Yes. Yeah, similar. Th- and then so the library in Final Cut Pro is the same as a project in... Most confusingly, Premiere yes. Pro. The library is the same as your project file if you're coming from Premiere Pro. Yeah. An event is sort of like a bin. Right. And then you have a project, which in Premiere Pro terminology is a sequence. Yes. So that's your actual video, so to speak, the timeline and all the settings associated with it, like what the frame rate is and the dimensions and stuff. That's called your project. Okay. So, without any further ado, I think it's about time we started this carnage. <laughs> um, I've made a folder here on my laptop called Neil Lesson, and that's where we're going to be working. If you're following along, make a folder somewhere. Again, ideally on an external SSD if you have one. If not, just you know, the desktop or whatever is going to be just fine for this. Um, we have got some source media here that we're going to be playing around with just for the purposes of this demo. Just some old files from the shots that we've done previously and some music that we've got from Epidemic Sound that we can use as well for the purposes of this tutorial. Cool. So we want to create our first library. So in Final Cut Pro, we are going to go to File, New, Library. And this is going to ask where do you want to save it? So I'm going to go to your Neil Lesson folder here and you can follow along and put it wherever it is that you'd like it to go. And you can call it wherever you fancy. So uh, I'm going to call this um, Neil's or Neil Lesson. That'll do. That doesn't matter if you use spaces or... No, it doesn't seem to matter. No, it's just a, a file um, which it then makes it's like one of these special Apple files that's actually kind of a zip of loads of other stuff inside. Okay. Um, so if you were to show the package contents of it, you can see all the files within that make up this um, library. Um, now actually it's worth considering this when we get to the very next step, which is where we're gonna import um, the videos into our library here. Um, you have two options. You can leave the video files and the audio files exactly where they are on the disk um, and just kind of reference them okay. from your library. Or you can actually copy them into your library. So this library file, if you did that option, would be nicely self-contained, okay. but massive. So yeah. <laughs> it depends which way you'd like to work. Comfortable? Yep. Okay. I've created a library. <laughs> well. So you're in your library, you'll notice now, and you've actually got some things you can see and click on. Okay. Um, you have a smart collection. We won't get into that too much today, um, but you do get an event. So by default, Final Cut will create you an event and it gives it today's date. And like I say, you can just dump all of your assets in there if you wanted to be lazy. But I prefer to be a bit more organized. So we're going to use this event that we've already got, and I'm going to rename this to be called Videos. If you wanted to make another event for music, you can right click on the library and click New Event. This will give you the opportunity to create a new event uh, with whatever name you like. So I'm going to call this one Music. And it asks you what library you want to create this in. You can have multiple libraries open at the same time. Okay which is actually quite handy if you're working on, or if you've got like an old video, and you've got a new video, and you had some clips from that one, and you want to kind of copy them over to this one, or grab some titles you made, or something like that. So it's quite nice being able to have multiple things open at the same time. Mm-hmm. It will start chugging a little bit if you do <laughs> yeah. that. But yeah, so it asks you what library to uh, import this into, but we've only got one, and we'll click OK. So that's made a second bin, if you want to call it that, but actually an event for music. Um, Lastly, what I like to do is have a dedicated uh, event just to hold my projects, Um, which like I say, these are your timelines essentially. You may want to have loads of the same source footage, like your videos, but you may want to have a few different projects. You might want to have like one that was more 16 by nine aspect ratio for going on, I don't know, YouTube but you might want an upright version of it to go as like an Instagram story or something like that. So you can write different projects, okay. but using the same footage. So if we finally create a new event, 
call this one projects. This is going to hold all of our projects. But you'll notice at the same time, you have the opportunity if you wanted to, in line, create new project whilst you're creating this event. But you've Neil's gone and jumped the gun and <laughs> clicked ahead. So we won't do that, but the option was there. All you get is the same screen as you get now. So in my projects event, I'm finally gonna create my new project. Yours looks different to mine. So yours by default looks like this. Yes. So at the box, you get this view. Um, and all it asks you for is a project name. So I'm gonna call this main. And it asks you again, like what event do you want to create this project in? If you were to use the automatic settings like here, um, what it would do is when you first import a video into the project, it will look at the frame rate, it will look at the resolution of the file okay. and it will kind of use those settings. Personally, I prefer to dial in my own settings so I know exactly what I want. So, I always click use custom settings. Okay. Now this gives you um, quite a lot of options. This first drop down here gives you what resolution would you like this video to be in. Um, and you have obviously 2K, 4K, 5K or custom. For the purposes of this, we're gonna go 4K, which is, um, <coughs> this is UHD 4K. Um, and you get to pick a frame rate. Now we're in the UK and most of our stuff's shot at 25 frames per second, so 25 frames per second works for me. Nice. You also get to pick a codec that it uses to do its rendering from. Now I wouldn't get too hung up on this just yet. We'll cover this much later, but the default Apple Pro is 422 is a sound choice, so you leave that selected as is. Mm -hmm. Um, and the audio is also great as the defaults go there. So click OK. Inside your projects event here on the left, you have this project called main. You can tell it's a project because it has like a little clapper board icon. Um, there's yours there. Now, interestingly, so Neil's view is different to my view. Yours looks more like this here. It's a good opportunity to show that you can, in these views of events, switch between more of a list view or more of like a, an oh. icon view. In fact, these aren't really icon views as you'll see when we import a video. You get like a very long preview of the video that kind of snakes around. <laughs> so um, it depends on the size screen that I'm on, but on a smaller, uh, a smaller screen like the laptop, I prefer the list view. I'm gonna keep it in this view just for now. Okay. Next step, let's import our videos. So if you click into the videos events, there's a big button there for importing media. You can click that or you can press command and I. Okay. This then brings up the import media interface. I'm going to go and find on my external hard drive, this source media folder and everything that's in this 25 folder here I'm going to highlight all of that and these are the files that I want to import into that into that videos event now over on the right it gives you some further options about what do you want to do when you import these files so do you want to add them to an existing event yes please yep. videos um, this is what I was saying here do you want to copy the uh -huh. files into the library or do you want to just leave them where they are? Now, if you're editing with multiple editors, it's kind of nice to have the media and your Final Cut library separate. So you can have one central source for the media. If we wanted to share the edit, we have the, the, live, the actual Final Cut file that we'd be sending to each other would be tiny. You don't want yes, to be sending it with true, all the yeah. media in it. But for the purposes of this, and for just doing kind of quick videos myself, I actually tend to just copy them over into the library. So copy to your, this library sounds good. Um, now this will actually apply some further keywords from uh, folder tags and things like that. So if we were to click on that folder and then just import that, everything would get a keyword tag of it of 25. Right. And that may be worth uh, doing in this instance because we've actually separated our source media out here into 25 frames per second footage and 50 frames per second footage. Um, now, everything else here where it says transcoding for creating optimized media and proxy media, all of these things I'll leave as they come out the box, i.e. disabled. 
In the other video that we talked about importing footage in much greater detail, uh, we went over all of these options. So if that sounds like something you'd later like to go and revisit, check the description box down below. We'll leave a little link to that. Excellent. Okay, right, enough of this chit chat. Let's get our videos Let's get imported. Our footage in. Boop. So what that's doing now in the background is copying the footage from where it was into the library right. file. So now that you know how to import footage, you're a bit of a whiz at this, right? Yeah, I can do that all day long. Um, we should import the music into the music event. Okay. But I'm not going to tell you what to do. So we're just, I'm just going to do it. I've done it. <laughs> right, he's a pro. <laughs> there we go. Well, thanks for watching this yeah. video. <laughs> right, so we actually have some um, stuff in our Final Cut Pro library now. Um, and some of these panels that were a bit empty previously have now been populated, so it's yes. maybe worth having a quick look. Um, so like you say, here is all of your uh, events and all of the contents of the events live in this panel here. Okay. Um, and you can switch your views between this big long kind of preview mode or a list mode. I prefer list mode personally. Next along here, you actually get quick access to iTunes, GarageBand and Photos and in there as well. Um, if you have stuff saved in Photos, then you can reference it directly without having to sort of export it out and import it back in again. All I would say is that it's probably best to export it and import it out as a separate thing rather than referencing assets directly because you don't know you may go and delete something from your iTunes, forgetting that it was even yeah. in the video, and uh, six months later going, oh, I wonder we're gonna edit that video and do something with it, and your music's gone and your photos have vanished, and yeah. so I never use that. This uh, third tab here is where titles and generators live. Uh, so for creating titles, text titles to go on the top of your videos, and also for uh, generators, which are things like backgrounds and solid colors that you can use to overlay to create interesting titles and slides and effects. Yes. We'll be going over that in a bit. Quite a few out of the box bollocks. You do, oh, you do yeah. get quite a few out of the box. Most of them are terrible, but yeah, you do get quite a few out of the box. So that's something, I suppose. Um, now in the middle, as I said, this is your, this is your preview window. Um, and start looking at some quick controls of things. You can press um, start and stop with the space bar. Over here on the right, you get your inspector window, like I say, so you can click on different different tabs here. So this is gonna give you information for the audio as part of this clip that we're looking at. Um, and if you click over on the eye, that will give you information on the, the video side of the clip that we are looking at. Um, metadata for the, for the video. Um, and when these clips end up in the timeline, you'll get even further controls where you can set like the scale of them and set keyframes for things and whatever else like this. Good stuff. Finally, down the bottom, we have the timeline. This is the main, the main crux of the program. This is where you do your editing. And on the right, on the very right, you'll see these two extra little buttons here. These hide and show two additional panels. The very right hand one here is for all of your transitions. And then the one just to the side of that is another little window you can open for all your installed effects. And we'll be covering effects and transitions in a, a short while in this video. Again, most of them out of the box are perhaps a little bit naff, bar just cross dissolves and stuff. Some of them with like the star swipes and whatever are a little bit over the top, but they're there. If you want to use them, they're there. I like those ones. <clears throat> so let's look at this clip that Neil took on his drone when I mean, he was on holiday. Where were you? Uh, it's Perrinporth in Perrin Cornwall. Nice, okay, so Neil took his drone out. Um, if he wanted to get this into the timeline, there's two ways that you could do this on this clip. You can use your mouse and just physically click on it, drag it down, drop it, and it's in. We don't like to use the mouse too much if we can help it when we're editing videos, do we? Because it slows us down. So let's delete that by pressing the backspace key and we'll look at it another way. So another way that you can get things into the timeline is by pressing the E key. Now the E stands for end, I think, and it will insert it at the end of whatever the last clip was. So you can press E and it will just chuck it in 
Mm. And because there's nothing else there, it actually goes at the beginning. But if I were to click on another clip and press E, it would just put it after that one. So you can start quickly building up your timeline that way if you wanted to. But we've got massive long clips here. This isn't what we want either. This drone footage doesn't really get going till, well, a while, does it? Let's have a look. It starts off on the grass. So you can see here on this list view that I've got anyway, when you've clicked on something, you can scrub over the top here to see what's going on. Okay. And if you're not in that view, but you're in this kind of preview, preview view, which I don't like, uh, you can scrub over the whole, the whole thing and it will start playing like that. Um, this is handy because then you can, you can set your in points and your out points. So mm -hmm. we know that we don't really want to show this stuff at the beginning with the grass. Let's say that it kind of gets interesting about here. I can set an end point by pressing I, which I believe is exactly the same as Premiere. Um, and if I say I, I want it to stop here where you've just, just spun around there, I'll press O. So I've set an in and an out point of this clip. And if I'm happy with that, I can now press E. And that much shorter clip will now right. go onto the timeline. There is another button that's worth, uh, there's one that I never use, which is for splitting it, it just puts it where the playhead is and it just cuts the clip in half. I can't even remember what that is. I never use it. It's pointless having anyway. The only other one that's handy is Q. <laughs> so Q will actually insert a clip over the top rather than at the okay. end. So if you're trying to build up B-roll over your edits quickly, if I have this little clip of <laughs> of you doing whatever you're doing and I just say I don't know in and out and then press Q you'll see that that pops it where the cursor was but over the top oh, yeah, that's good. okay so if I drag this other clip down here and Neil you can see at the start I didn't get my end point quite right you're kind of looking a bit windswept <laughs> and you're looking a bit confused <laughs> to me, but, um, that's my usual look yeah Oh, he's like, you're doing your claps and stuff. Oh, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> right. So let's say that, oh, we got this in point completely wrong. We need this video to start like, oh, more like here somewhere. You can actually trim these clips down quite easily once they're already in the timeline. So hover over the beginning or the end of a given clip and you'll see that you get your cursor changes to like two arrows mm. and like the end of a film strip. Now the end of the film strip will kind of go from the right and tear around to the left if you're trimming the beginning of that clip and you'll see if you go just a little bit to the left it will kind of flip round so that's trimming the end of the previous clip. So if you want to trim Neil up to where our playhead is about here I can just drag it along and that's now trimmed off. Similarly, if at the end of this drone shot I thought I wanted it to end more kind of around about here before it pans around too hard, I can just drag this back. Easy peasy. So one thing that if you haven't already noticed is kind of weird compared to probably anything you're used to in other editors is the notion of Apple's or Final Cut Pro 10's magnetic timeline. Okay. So in Premiere Pro, this clip here, if I thought, well, I know that's gonna be near the end somewhere, I don't know what I'm gonna have, I'll just drag it over here, yeah. and then we'll get there when we get there. No dice. Okay. Everything snaps back. So if I were to delete this clip here that I didn't want anymore, everything snaps back. Okay, so you get no gaps between. You don't get any gaps out the box like this, which is kind of handy, but it does, I found it kind of a bit infuriating when I first started, but I think that's just because of the way I used to lay my edits out in Premiere. I used to kind of, yeah, like I said, I said, well, I know this bit's going near the end, so I'll just drag that there, and yeah. when I get to that bit, I'll get to that bit. Um, you can't do that really like this, so that's a bit of a bit of something that's, to think that's, about. That's, yeah, that's definitely different. So you'll notice that you can put things wherever you want, if I undo that a bit. 
when they're not on this dark bar. So this dark bar is called the primary storyline and that's magnetic and anything on it will always snap back. But if you drag things up onto the top, oh. then they can go wherever you want. But it's just when they're on the primary storyline that you kind of right. you get this magnetic effect. Now you can actually, if you want to, like I say, if I delete this clip, it shuffles things up. If you wanted to delete that clip, but keep the space that that clip held, you can hold the function button and press delete. Oh, okay. So that will actually replace that with what's called a gap. So it will make a, a physical kind of gap placeholder, which you can then drag around and make as long as you want. So if you knew there was going to be a few minutes here of, of stuff, and then over here we needed this clip, you can actually put these gaps in. Okay. Um, you can make as many gaps as you want. In fact, if I wanted to make another gap, you go up to um, Edit, yep. Insert Generator, okay. and then you have either a placeholder or a gap, which are essentially the same thing, apart from a placeholder looks a bit more fancy because it's got some funny people on it and some oh, trees. Nice. Uh, <laughs> whereas a, a gap's just a dark area. So can you have multiple main timelines then? No. So it's only one? Yeah, it's just called your primary timeline and that's kind of it. So when you're layering B-roll, you know it's, it's all in within one go. Basically. It's all, yeah, you just start stacking so it up. How do you stack titles up. over there? Oh, oh. <laughs> spoilers. We'll get to that bit. Cool your jets. <laughs> <laughs> now we've actually got some clips in the timeline. If you click on one of your clips. Okay. <laughs> Another lovely face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah you're all finding the good ones there, aren't you? <laughs> um, you will now see over in your inspector, you've got more things that you can do. So the inspector panel is made up, well, it depends what you're looking at, but a normal clip, video clip with the audio, have these four little icons. So the eye icon on the very right is metadata about the original sort of video, like the date that it was shot and what camera it was shot on and that kind of stuff. And it's frame size and it's frame rate. That's all good stuff, right? Then you have the audio tab, and this is where you can change some of the stuff to do with the EQ and add audio effects and administer audio effects, but we'll get to that in a little while. The next tab along is the color grading tab for that particular okay. clip. Again, we'll get to that near the end, but the one I want to draw your attention to is this very first one. Now this very first one is the sort of the display of this clip, so you've got the opacity of the clip, um, its position X and Y within the frame, um, your scale so you can zoom all the way in on your face or all the way back out again. Um, you can also go into these little boxes here rather than using the sliders and you can obviously just type in values or once you've clicked into the box you can sort of use your mouse to just slide up and down instead. Now I'll leave it up to you to go and play with all of these kind of different effects that it's got its own kind of form of stabilization in here. Okay. A little bit like warp stabilizer, um, some rolling shutter fixes. One thing that is worth seeing, which is down here, the spatial conform. Now I use this one quite a lot. Now you get a few options, fit or fill or none. Our, uh, our main project that we're doing here, this timeline, is uh, the Resolutions UHD. And you can find this out by clicking on the project itself. And over there you'll see in the inspector, 3840 by 2160. Mm -hmm. um, so you can actually use the inspector to inspect other things, like the whole library has its inspector panel and stuff. Um, the project has an inspector panel where you can see, like I say, all the, the dimensions. And if you wanted to go and change it, because you, you made a mistake, that's where you can go and change the settings of your right, project okay. that you set up. Um, I know that one of these videos in here, this one here, is actually a 1080p clip. Um, I'm going to just drag that in here and I'll trim it down to about here where we're, we're looking at this hot dog stand. That, by default, here we go, has gone to fit. If the spatial conform was none, you'll see that you'll get your little 1080p footage but it will just sort of plop it in. Oh uh, yeah. Um, so by default, you get fit. 
Now fit, I think, is get the smallest dimension that will actually then fit in. So you may still end up with black bars. Right. Um, whereas fill makes sure that the whole okay. viewport, so to speak, is filled with that. But it will um, pop it, obviously. Yeah, so you'll lose stuff out the edges, whereas fit will just get this, the, make sure that one of the dimensions yep. is filled, so you'll end up with some black stripes if the aspect ratio isn't correct. But it's quite an easy way, and I'm, I could be wrong. Premiere was there just to like just change a drop down, and it just changed to fill it, or did you have to go in and say scale to? And not that I found now to scale it. Yeah, so I find that quite a useful feature. That's pretty good. That's pretty cool. So something else that's quite a handy key. It's only just one key, but that's how to disable the clip. Okay. Um, so let's say I use this quite a lot actually with with B roll. I'm trying out some B-roll, maybe I think that B-roll would look good there. I'll play the video, see the clip come in. If I decide I don't want it, but I don't want to delete it, you can just hit V and you'll see it all kind of gray it out. And you can do that anywhere on the okay. primary timeline or whatever. You can also do it with audio. So it's quite good if you've got a few tracks, you can try one, think, oh, it's not working, V, try another one. You can have a few all stacked up. So V is quite a useful key yep. for uh, disabling a clip. But the most common key that I probably use is switching between this pointer here, which is like the main one, and the blade tool. Okay. So A is this view, which is like your pointer view. Yep. And B is B for blade. Oh, yeah, nice. So, the blade tool, if you're not already aware, is so you can chop a clip. So you can trim a clip, obviously. Show like I've shown you how you can do that. If you press A and you go into the point of view, I can trim this clip along or do whatever I want to do with it. But if I want to actually split this clip here, I can press B and where I want to split it, click in there, and that now creates two clips. Um, and I can do whatever I want with this. I maybe I'll put that one in uh, back up there and stuff, so we can start chopping, literally chopping the, literally the chopping. clips up, moving them around with the blade tool. So B for blade and A for pointer, I think. A, a pointer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not very helpful. A for pointer, <laughs> B for blade. So let's actually pretend that we were doing a nice little montage of your drone experience here. Um, I might go and get another clip further along, like. This one here, you're going over some hills, that'll do. I'm not, I'm not gonna be too careful with this, but I'm gonna put that kind of in there. So we're starting to build up a nice little drone sequence. I wanna put some music to this. Yeah. So I'm gonna go over to my music uh, event. And we've got a few examples of songs here. I'm gonna just drag one down. Now you'll see music lives underneath all your video layers. This is a bit different again to Premiere. Premiere you had Videos and audios, there was like a divider line, wasn't there? And all the videos went stacked up yes. that way and yeah. audio all went stacked down that way. Um, in Final Cut Pro, it's not like that at all, as you can clearly see. Um, all the videos do go up and they stack on top of each other and audios can stack down. However, the audio is still with that video clip. So, I mean, you can detach it if you want. But it's not like, oh, all audios go down there and the videos go right, up there. Okay. They kind of live with each other. You have this kind of primary timeline and some videos can go above it and some audio can go below it. It's all centered around this primary timeline. So it is very different. Yeah. But if I were to just, I don't know, we don't know which clip you want. This is where I say it's quite handy. You can press V on both of these and then I can maybe press V on this one and we can just try it out and see what we think it sounds like. Quite nice. Yeah, lovely. Um, or we'll try this other one, see if it's more fitting. That one seems better for our nice beachy drain like scene. Yeah. yeah, okay. You can do all the same things that you could do with your clip, but with your audio. So you can trim it and cut it and splice it and do whatever it is that you want to do. But with audio, you're more interested probably in, in sort of volume yep. and things like that. Uh, now you can actually make these tiles, if you want to call it that, all your items on the timeline bigger and smaller. There's options over here. 
If I click on this icon here, yep. see that one? That one. Um, you've got this like slider, which is to zoom the entire uh, timeline uh, yeah. up and down. So you can do that using that, but that's a bit of a faff to click that and click that and whatever. You can do it as well with command plus and command minus. Nice. But the one that I use a lot is shift and Z. Shift and Z will just make your timeline sort of fit your screen. Um, but also under here, you can say what the ratio is of the the video to the audio of your clips. So I want yeah. mainly audio or a little 50-50 or mainly video and a little slither of audio. Um, so I kind of like them to be sort of around the 50-50 mark around about here. And this one actually shows like how big do you want your clips. Okay. So you can go really big if you so want. The height. Yes. Um, you'll see on this, for example, here, you have this trim like you can normally do when you hover over the very left edge of your audio. Oh yeah, I see the two little arrows. Um, but if you go right in the middle, where the this audio bar line, in fact, let's talk about the audio bar line first. You can drag this up and down and that will change the level of that particular audio track. Okay. But you'll notice that it kind of does it in 1 dB yes. increments. If you wanted to really just slightly finesse it, you can't do it from there. But you can do it from the inspector panel. If I click on that item and come up to the inspector panel, make sure I'm in the audio property. Yep. Here you get your volume control and you can do it in 3.1 rather than just 3 to 4 and stuff. So you get a lot more granularity with it up here. But going back down to here, so if you do hover at the beginning of a clip or the end of a clip near that volume line, you'll see that the icon changes to two left and right arrows instead. If you click that and drag it in, you'll see in the background what that's doing is kind of drawing in like a mask yes. um, and it'll give you a second value on, the, on this little tool tip. So that will fade it from naught decibels to whatever decibel it's set to be over Clever. that period of time. So if I just wanted to fade this in over two seconds ish, we'll drag it to about there, let go. And now that means it will fade in from naught to one over the course of two seconds. Nice. If you wanted to be a little bit more advanced though, you can use keyframes. Right. I think it's a good time to talk about keyframes. I think so. Yeah. We're starting to get into more advanced bits. So let's add some keyframes. Let's, for the sake of argument, let's just say we want it to go really quiet again here before it changes to that clip and then go loud again. So you're aware of keyframes and what they do? Yes. Um, if you're not aware, keyframes are sort of automation points you can place along the length of an item, be it a piece of music or a piece of video footage. And you can say at this particular point, let's call it like three seconds in, I want a value of something. In this instance, we're gonna have volume to be this. And then at this next point, I want it to be this. And then at this next point, I want it to be this, and so on and so forth. Here, we want the volume to kind of stay at one all the way till, I don't know, about here. And just for the sake of a demo, we want it to dip right down when the clip changes and then come back up to one sort of right about there. Yeah. You can create keyframes from the inspector panel once again. If you come up to this volume here, in fact most things you'll notice as you're looking around things like scale of a clip and whatever, as you hover over the control you'll see this sort of diamond thing with a cross in it. Okay. Yeah. This icon right there and that's to add a keyframe. So when you click that, that will add a keyframe for the, select, the clip that you got selected exactly where your playhead is. So I want my music to stay kind of at its normal level till about here. So I'm going to add a keyframe right there. And you'll see it creates a little, a little diamond, little diamond yeah. down here on your, in your item. Um, and I'm going to just create another keyframe sort of around there. And you don't have to use your mouse, you can use um, your left and right arrows as well. Oh, yeah. I'll leave that there and I'll put another keyframe sort of, I don't know, there. Okay. That's where we'll dip it down. We'll want another point around about here where we'll want it to 
start rising back up. Yep. And then another point here where it will go back to full volume. So we've ended up with four keyframes. And now you've got your keyframes. Next to the keyframe tool, you've got these little kind of shortcuts for jump to the next keyframe, jump to the next keyframe, or jump to previous keyframe, sorry. So you can jump around from keyframe to keyframe, making sure that you're exactly on the keyframe. Because now that you've got keyframes, if you were to just stick your playhead somewhere else that wasn't exactly on a keyframe and change the volume, it would create a new keyframe for you, so you could end right, up in okay. a bit of a mess. So we're, this is the one that we want the volume to be all the way down at, so I'm going to just drag the volume down to minus infinity. Well, well let's just call it actually, I don't know, like minus, minus 30, and I'll type that value in. And I want it to stay at minus 30 till this keyframe here. So this one here, I'm going to press go across to this next keyframe. And I want this one to also be minus 30. And then going across to my final keyframe, that's back up to naught. Okay. How are you looking? It's Good. got the same. It's got it the definitely same. feels a lot easier than doing it through Premiere Pro. Does it? Yeah. You used to have that little, you used to do them in like yeah, a little yeah, separate was, window, didn't you? Yeah, Rather than actually on the timeline. That's um, a lot, you could do it on the timeline, but it was a nightmare. Uh, that's a lot easier. Basically. Didn't you have like, there you had like extra little drop downs you could pick what the tool was or something yeah. and click and stuff. Do you think that's easier? That seems a lot slicker. Okay. Less. And you can do that with, like I say, you can do that with anything. You can animate the scale of something. You can animate its opacity. You can animate whatever. So we do use that quite a lot for when we're making titles and we want to animate the title in and or just zoom it in really fast to a point and then scale it just a little bit and yeah. swipe it out the way and things like that. So it's useful for building up kind of mediocre looking animations and whatnot but really handy for doing things like this, like ducking audio out where you want it to duck out. Yeah, maybe. especially when you're doing like a voiceover. Absolutely, you know, yeah. You want the music to... If you're cutting in between B-roll, you might want the music to start really quietly as you're leading up to the B-roll bit and then psh, jump straight in. So it gets used for a lot of that stuff. Let's have a little listen, make sure it worked. Perfect. Happy days. So next, changing the speed of clips. I've got a bit of an idea of the, the this is structured, believe me. I know it might not seem it. We have got, a, I've got some notes here, things to cover. So I've kind of, we've talked about audio a little bit. Yep. One of the other things that we do, we do, we shoot a lot of slow motion footage. We want to slow it down in post to make it look Pucker. Pe peachy, right? <laughs> now this clip that I dragged in earlier on of uh, the man selling his hot dog. Oh, I'm going to mute this in a minute. This is actually in uh, 50 frames per second. We're in a 25 frames per second timeline, which means we can slow it down by two times. Um, now, once I've clicked on my clip, I can go over here, you see this little icon just there. It looks a bit like a, a speedo or something. Yep. A tachometer, I think. The, uh... A tachometer or whatever, yes. So if you click on that, you can see at the top, you get a few sort of presets, like slow it down by 50% or 25%, or fast, like speed it up two times, speed it up four times. Um, so I'm quite happy to just click slow, 50%, boosh. Now you see you get this big kind of retiming bar that appears over the top of this clip. And now if I play this back, yeah, we've got 50 frames per second footage playing at half the speed in a 25 frame per second timeline. And put my teeth in, um, hence you get this slow motion effect which looks pretty cool. Um, you'll also notice now that you're in this mode, you've got these little handles on the end of this retiming bar. If you go right to the very end on yours, yep. you get like a little weird it's like a little... snaily thing. Yeah, what is that? <laughs> um, so you can just click on the drop down arrow on the title if you want, and you can change it to be actually 25%, uh, all those same sort of options you had before. But you can just click and drag this around. So, and you yeah, see it changes okay. color. So if I drag it down here, now it's made it like 500% 500, 500 
So it's like five times faster than it was. It's, it's purple if you're going faster, orange if it's going slower. So you can retime it a little bit if you wanted to. If you had like a very specific, if you're trying to match it up to some music and your clip wasn't quite long enough, you could probably get away with dropping it to like 49 or 51% slower or something. It wouldn't be totally perfect in terms of the frame rate matching, but it will fill that gap. And Should we do a transition? Let's do a transition. Let's do a transition. Now, like I say, most of the transitions that you get out of the box, I think are, a, are perhaps a little bit lame. Um, but for the sake of this, we'll just go and do a nice simple cross dissolve. Because okay. who doesn't like a nice cross dissolve? So get two clips, any two clips on your timeline. Um, now the nice thing I like about these effects, and is, uh, well, both the effects and the transitions in Final Cut, and I honestly can't remember if it did it in Premiere, maybe it did and I just didn't notice. But you get a pretty cool preview, you can scrub over these and see what it is that it would do when you applied it. Oh, yeah, like weird. the 3D rectangle, you can yeah. imagine what that would do. That's pretty crazy. Should we just use that one actually? Yeah, I think that's the craziest mm -hmm. thing find. Okay, so I'm just gonna click it, drag it in, drop it between those two. Easy as that. We wanna see how these smart Whoop! <laughs> There we go, it's like we're all the way back in uh, the 90s again. Now, you can make these transitions, you've got the same uh, trim tools with these transitions, so if you want to make it a bit longer, and you can drag out how long that transition takes. So this transition here can take however long it you want. You can have a really fast one. Test work. Windows. A really slow one like that, there we go. What a terrible, terrible transition. Now along with transitions, effects work almost exactly the same way. That's just in the little next tab along, you get your effects. Now your effects can be things like, well, you can, you can peruse at your own leisure. They have got quite a lot. And again, you kind of get a bit of a preview of what it would be. So if I click on this clip here of you flying a drone, in fact, I'll get a, sh I'll get a yeah, that one will do. Uh, Ooh, you got an aged film effect, which makes it look like you were flying it around during the war. So there's a whole bunch oh, of that effects that you can have, or this camcorder effect here. Yeah, that one will do. So if you want to use an effect, again, just click, drag it over, drop it on your clip. So how do you um, how do you delete an effect? So I've got a bit crazy here and I've layered a few up. Okay, good question. Um, so when you start whacking these effects on, yeah. You click on your clip, you'll see here on your effects, you've got like a little toggle ball window. Oh, I see. And at the top you've got effects, and they'll all sit there in, inside there. And you can toggle each one on and off individually if you want. And a lot of them have customizable properties. For example, on this one here with the camcorder, where it says rack for the record, I can put Totally exposed, and now, oh, I can't even spell it. Now we've got totally exposed as our camcorder oh, nice. and a thing. So a lot of these effects do have configuration options. But yeah, if you wanted to delete it, <laughs> yes, terrible. <laughs> if you wanted to delete it, you can either just disable it by unticking it, or you can just hit delete. Yeah, and okay, it's gone. That's interesting that you can, like I say, each, effect has its own sort of settings built into it as well. Yeah, they have their own That's parameters. Um, now the, the ones that, these are obviously, they come out of the box made by Apple yeah. um, and they do have a lot of kind of good helpful parameters. When you start purchasing third party effects, your mileage may vary depending on how good the author of the extension yeah. was. A lot of the ones that I've ended up buying are pretty good and you get loads of configuration options. Some of them are a bit like drop it on. That's, the best. that's your lot. Um, but yeah, good question. How do you remove an effect or how do you edit an effect? There we go. One thing you will notice with a lot of these effects and when you start doing things like adding color grading and things to your clip is that the amount of processing power required to actually output that with all of the effects applied is increased greatly. And a lot of these clips will need kind of pre-rendering out before you can really watch them. Yeah. I've applied this camcorder effects to you flying a drone around here. 
But you'll see at the top, you've got these little dots. Oh yeah, see them. Now those dots mean that that section of that video hasn't been rendered out. When we set up our project, if you remember correctly, it said, what codec do you want to use for doing your rendering? And we oh, yeah. chose um, ProRes 422. So in the background, what's happening is um, Final Cut Pro is constantly rendering your video out without you needing to render it. One of the things that sets Final Cut Pro apart and editors think it's fantastic is, is export times. Because what it's doing is constantly, constantly rendering in the background. Okay. So when you actually go to do your main render, it's got most of the footage it actually already needs. Right. If you export in exactly the same codec that you've done all your renders in, then it doesn't even need to render. Because it's already It's rendered. there, yeah. So it just goes, there you go. <laughs> so you can end up kind of doing a render in a matter of seconds because it's literally just moving files around or just taking a few bigger files and splicing those together and kind of uh, off you go. So that's where Final Cut Pro becomes quite powerful. To really gain the leverage of this though, you have to make sure that your background rendering is turned on. So I've just disabled it. So if you come up to Final Cut Pro in the menu and click on Preferences, yep. click on the Playback tab, you see there's this rendering, you've got a background render property. Okay. Um, I always click that and it says, how long do you want to wait until it starts? And I'll, st I'll put it as like, yeah, 0.3 seconds sounds good to me. That sounds pretty prompt, doesn't it? Yep. Uh, close out of that. You can see it's already started chugging because now it, all this is going and my dots are going. That's worth showing this. This is the background activity monitor. See this little pie chart up here? Oh yeah. You always got a tick on that's it, right. so it's all done. Um, but if I click on it, this shows you everything that's going on in the background. So it could be rendering, it could be important media, so it might be copying files in that you've just asked to come in. It could be transcoding stuff into proxies, sharing is when you do your final export, all that kind of stuff. And when it's not doing anything, you get your big tick. If I was to add another effect onto this, cartoon for example and drag that on it will need to re-render i'll leave it a second and you'll see now that's now chugging through yeah, in the I'll background it. and it will go and you can see the little dots moving along the screen there as it renders out like i say if you know you're going to be exporting in a different flavor of prores you might want to set your project up to render the background previews in that flavor of prores makes sense so that when you do final <coughs> export at the end you can just use the render files directly. Happy days. We briefly touched on it earlier on, up on the top left here, there's another uh, little tab there for titles. Oh yes. And now if you were happy with how many terrible, terrible <laughs> animations for the effects there were, you'll be more than chuffed with how many terrible, terrible <laughs> titles there are. There's quite a lot of, uh, there's quite a lot of really horrible ones in here, which is great. Let's put, yeah, let's put this one on the top. Oh, I like atmosphere. Do you? You would. I'm going to put this one here. So you can drag any title down and you see it kind of lives as like this little purple slither over the top of your footage. Okay. And again, this is probably going to sound a bit repetitive, but if you hover over the ends, you get your little kind of trim tools. So if you want to make that title a lot longer, you can do. If you want to make it a lot shorter, equally, you can do. Now the titles, they get a fifth new tab in your expector window oh, which yeah. is for the text stuff um, and that's how i can now write in my message and you can kind of do things like pick what font it is and all of this stuff and this applies to pretty much all the titles um, some of the titles will have different options depending on what the title is itself like I don't know, if it spins around and goes upside down, it might have a property of like, how, how much upside down does it go, which doesn't therefore apply to a different type of title. It doesn't go upside down. I think you get what we're trying to say here. I tend to use the basic title just because it's a plain, nice title, and these are all a bit whizzy for me. But there we go. You can put titles on, and uh, wow, that is special. Very good. Neil's made a lovely title over there. I'm very proud of it. I'll sit down in the fridge like that. Um, so you can drag these around. It's worth saying as well, if you wanted to make another title, 
Uh, you can press option, and this applies to anything, not just titles, but option, click, drag, that duplicates an item. So it could be anything. It could be a clip, it could be an audio track, it could be a title. Okay. If you press option and drag it, that's how you duplicate items in the timeline. Something that's worth noting as well, actually, with these um, clips, these titles, you'll see that it's got this little, if you look really closely, it's got like a little line at the beginning and a little purple dot on the clip below it. You got one of them? Nope. Have a look at your, uh, have a look at your audio. Have you got one on your audio? Especially if you move it around, you'll see, see as I drag my audio down here, I've got this kind of stretchy line with a little dot. Now that's because everything is centered around this primary timeline. Oh yeah, I see. Yeah, you see yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, I can see the little dot now. So everything's centered around this primary timeline, as we said before, and all this stuff, this is just yeah. kind of hanging off, literally hanging off the primary timeline. And that funny little dot, that shows where that clip is attached to oh, the primary see, timeline. Yes. You can see there now. So you can get yourself into a bit of a pickle, like, let's take this example here. I've got this song, and it's attached to this clip. If I delete this clip, it deletes the song as well. I just noticed that. Yeah, I did that. And list. when you first start, you can be thinking like, what is it doing? <laughs> and it's a bit annoying. So what you can do to get around this is change that point where that auxiliary media is attached to the primary timeline. Okay. So that little dot, that shows where it's attached and what clip is attached to. If you want to change it, put your playhead where you want the attachment to happen. So I'm going to attach it to this second clip here. Okay. And then you hold command and option and you click on that clip the audio clip this is. So in your case, it would be the title. So you click on the thing that you want to change the yep. sticky point on, and you'll see now that that's moved that along. And if I did this on this other audio track down the bottom too, now they're both attached at that exact same point, which is to this second clip rather than the first clip, which now means if I wanted to, that I could delete this first see. clip. Yeah. And it doesn't knacker up the rest of my timeline. My audio is still there. Now, admittedly, it hasn't left a nice gap, so my audio does kind of start where yeah. it was. But it hasn't deleted it all. But it doesn't actually is... start there, though. It starts where the point is. Yeah. So that's how you can move where that little attachment is. And that caught me out so many times when, yeah. when you start adding things up and down. You need to be careful of where it's attaching to its primary timeline because the primary timeline is the daddy. And if you delete something there that there's loads of things attached to, they'll be gone forever. So one of the tabs that we have seen earlier on and we haven't really touched upon yet is color correction. Now this is definitely not something we're gonna get into that's, too far. Not, that's gonna be another video, isn't it? It's a whole minefield, the color correction side of things. Um, but I'll show you where the tools live and um, we will be doing further videos on color correction within Final Cut Pro very soon so mm -hmm. don't fear subscribe if you want to be notified when those videos come out however let's just do a super basic edit on a clip and then we'll have a look how it goes shall we yep so to make color corrections to a given clip that's this little middle icon here now you can set what you want your default color correction tool to be so when you click on that what do you get? I don't think you'll get this view. I think you no, get I something else. No, I had something different. I had this um, sort of like this. Yes. That? So that's in your preferences. You can uh, you can set what you want your default color correction tool to be here. Now yours is color board. Yep. Mine is color wheels. You've got color curves. They all, to a certain extent, do much of a muchness. The curves are the most powerful tool by far. I like the color wheels for just doing a quick and dirty color correction. So yeah. I set that as my default, but you don't have to just use one though. You can stack them up so you can do some wheels adjustments, then some curves adjustments, then Okay, so you can get it sort yeah. of roughly right and then fine tune it if you need to. So the wheels, if I just do a super quick overview of what's going on here with the color wheels, um, I can change the white balance of the clip here using the slider for the temperature. Yep. 
I can make it loads warmer, I can obviously make it loads cooler, and I can change the, the magenta tints like you would do with any other white balance. Um, but the main point of the wheels are, this is your overall exposure at the top. Okay. Then you have highlights, shadows, mid-tones. The left slider is the amount of saturation for that given right. part of the spectrum that you've selected. So if I wanted to desaturate all of the shadows, I could go to the shadows wheel, drag it down, and now all the shadows are desaturated, but the highlights remain. Um, and if you want to reset anything, there's this little arrow here that you can click, which will reset the entire wheel. Oh, yeah. But I find that these wheels are really helpful. So you've got saturation on the left, you've got exposure on the right. Okay. So if I wanted to bring my shadows down a bit like that, then if I wanted to raise my mid-tones, or maybe I wanted to lower my mid-tones and raise my highlights, give it a bit more of a contrasty look like that, I can do that. And then these are the color shifts within that. So if I wanted to make my highlights really aqua -y, I can kind of push them towards the aqua side okay. or drag them towards the warm side. That Hollywood look. Yes, indeed. Um, and this is where you'd like, there's no right or wrong answers. There's obviously guidelines that you can follow, but this is how you can get creative and, and make your own styles for your videos. But the tools all exist in here anyway. Um, I just want to show you where they are. Um, and like I say, we'll be doing a much more in-depth color grading tutorial for Final Cut Pro soon, because I think it is useful to know um, all the tools and how to use them best. Yeah. But there we go, that's a very quick color grade. And you'll see, so um, that now exists also as an effect. So if you go back to your inspector, that's now just an effect of color oh, wheels cool. that you've added. So if you want to turn it off, you got the before shot, turn it on, you got your after shot, which isn't actually too bad for a little two second grade though I wasn't good. even looking. <laughs> um, if I wanted to plot that same grade on this next shot, I don't have to do it all over again. You can copy properties of clips from one clip to another. Okay, so that is something that is different from <clears throat> our sort of workflow in Premiere Pro where we, where we would normally put an adjustment layer in. Ah, well, yes. See, unfortunately, and I do not understand why, um, it, there is no such notion of an, of an adjustment layer within Final Cut Pro out of the box. Oh, okay. But I shall show you in a minute how to create one because there are ways. However, for now, let's presume that we haven't got that. We've just got two clips. I've just made a whole bunch of changes to clip one and I want to apply them to clip two. How do I do that? So the first thing we want to do yep. is you want to copy your clip just by pressing Command and C on okay. the clip. That's the one with all the properties on that you want to copy over. Go and click on the clip you want to apply it to. So um, click on the main clip. Yep. And now you want to press Command and Shift and Paste. Okay. And what that does is brings up this window of which bits of that last clip is it that you actually want to copy over? Now we haven't done any other effects on here, like we haven't changed the transform, the position or anything, but if we had, it would know, well, these aren't default values, so it would tick them off. But maybe you only want the color wheels, so you can go through and say, oh, I only want to copy over these bits and bobs. Color wheels, cool, paste, and now our look has been applied. Go, and it's over on the second clip as well, which is cool, right? Oh yeah. Although kind of tedious, like you say, an adjustment layer would be better. Just square across the top, yeah. Now, like I say, they don't exist natively, but there are plenty of uh, people that have made them. You can go and download them, and it's a bit of a hack. Basically, it then becomes like a title that you can use, a title with no properties on it, like no text but you can drag it out and you can apply effects to it and it's like a translucent title that you can just put color grades on. Okay. So, head to the download link in the description below to go and download a example of an adjustment layer. Neil is gonna go and download it now. We'll get it installed on his Mac following the installation instructions that come with the download and uh, we'll be straight back. A few moments later, Okay, so Neil's gone and downloaded his adjustment layer. I have. 
So like I said, this is more of a title hack. So it lives in the titles area, which is weird, but this is what we got. So you go over to titles, I've got mine here. It's called adjustment layer. Got it. And you've got an adjustment layer called adjustment. You can drag this on much like you could just with a normal title. And you can put that over the top of your footage. And now I can do um, some crazy adjustments to the color grade on this. So um, I might add yeah, a color curve and put loads of contrast in it. There we go, loads of contrast on that uh, color, on that adjustment yeah. layer. And that's applied to all the clips underneath. Pretty handy. That's really good. Cool. So the very last step is sharing this video with the big wide world. Neil's is particularly special. I've been looking at it over his shoulder. <laughs> it's quite the treat. Um, when you're ready to export your final, your final render, um, what I like to do, I like to keep a ProRes master of everything that we do. That's like a nice, reasonably full quality, very low compression, full master. Um, that's the one that uses the render files directly. Okay. You end up with quite a big file, so you don't want to be doing this if you haven't got the storage space. But if you have and you can afford the luxury of using up a bit of space to keep that nice, good quality master file, I like to do that just as a backup in case anything ever happens with this. I've got a really good quality backup that I can use. And then I also render it out as like a compressed H.264 that we can put on YouTube or wherever we want to do that. We're happy with our project. Um, we want to share it. The last button really is right at the top here. There we go, and that's the share button. In fact, have I mentioned, just as a bit of a, a, late, a late entry into the <laughs> thing, these ones next to it, if oh, you are okay. struggling for space, those just toggle off the different um, windows at the top so you can have your yeah. timeline only, like your preview window or your other bits and bobs. And also, whilst we were just talking about color grading, um, if you press Command and 7, there's extra secret windows as well that you can add. Oh, wow, okay. So you get your, your, your tools, your color grading tools. Now I like to have my RGB parade and a vector scope but you can, you've got Luma there, but you can configure how many tools you want and which yeah. tool you want in which bit. Um, so that's pretty powerful as well. Um, and you can actually save all of this once you've got it all kind of figured out to your liking, like I really like this, you can go and create your own workspaces. So up here on window, if you go to workspace, you can click save workspace as, and you can give it a name. So you can say like Neil's workspace. I've got two here. I've got James edit, which is when I'm on my big 30 odd inch 4K monitor at home. And James edit map book, which I'm actually not in right now, but if I click that, that will switch my well, okay. arrangement around. This is more optimized for just being on a map book. The stuff that I don't need is kind of out the way because I haven't got much space. Um, but you may want to have color grading kind of yeah, workspace, cool. which has got all your different scopes and stuff, and an editing one, which is more about this file system. And so it's up to you. Feel free to have a play with have that. A tinker. Anyway, we have finished our amazing video. Let's export it out to the world. So the very top right button is the share button. Okay. Now you see you have a number of options in here. I only really ever use two. I use occasionally save current frame which is good for just getting a still a grab of your video that you're looking at right now thumbnails yeah so i really like that there we go save current frame um and that will save me a png file wherever i want desktop that will do done and again you'll see the little wind the your little wheel up here that's your processor wheel for everything so that's doing a background task now of sharing right Oh, it's done now, but there we go, and it will render that file out for you. The master file, that's how you can uh, export your video. I, I don't really bother with the others. I think you can do everything you need to in here. So if we go export and master file. So the main part of this is the settings file of your export, which is where you can select, do you want to export your video and audio, or just video or just audio. Um, and you also get to pick the codec that you want. I find Apple ProRes 422 fits in fine for our stuff. 
Now, because, like I said before, we use that as our render file option when we made our whole uh, project at the beginning, this should now just use the render files that it's already made to make our video. So it should be pretty quick. So one thing I've noticed on this export uh, screen, which is different from Premiere Pro, is on Premiere Pro you could pick a segment of the clip to export. Oh, okay. Or the entire sequence. Right. You can do that. It is a bit fiddly, but you can do that. You do it with in and out points of the whole timeline itself. Right, okay. So if I wanted to just export this first bit, I could uh, press an I there and press an O there and then export and it would just export that bit of the primary timeline. You'll notice as well, when you get this first screen, you can see what you're going to export. You can scrub this oh, bit wow, as well. Okay. That's pretty cool. So you can see that the start of my video is where it was, and the end is there. Um, so yeah, you can do it that way if you want, um, but you just click off and then you're kind of where you were. So, getting back to this then, we're going to export the whole thing, you can see the whole thing there. Settings, I'm going to do ProRes 422 um, and I'm just going to export it back in the folder that it came from on the same drive, go. So we'll leave that chugging away for a second. Um, so can you check the progress? On you the, can click uh, this bar and it will tell you the progress, so I'm up to like 10% of mine. 2%? Yeah, yours will be a lot longer because he's got some pretty wacky effects going on in there. <laughs> All the effects. So then guys, that's it. A kind of a whistle stop tour of Final Cut Pro 10. Um, did you find it helpful? I found it really helpful actually. Um, going from knowing nothing about it at all, I feel confident now I can go and edit some footage. And you'll find that like the more you do, the more you'll realise, oh, how do I do that bit? But the, at least you know you, you know the I way. Know the You're not opening up and going, where do I, where do I start? Yeah, yeah. I, know, I know the basics. Yeah. And hopefully that's what you guys now know. If you knew nothing before, you now know the basics that you need to just go in, start dropping some clips in, and uh, start editing some awesome videos to put on your YouTube channels and things like that. Yeah. Um, if that video was helpful, it would be awesome if you could give it a like, uh, comment down below, subscribe even, that'd be the best, wouldn't that'd it? That'd be good. And hit that little bell icon as well to be notified of our latest releases. Awesome, right, and Catch you in the next one. See you in the next one.